Hi, this is Shadi. Today we're going to be looking at modern MMA training and compare it with that of the old Jiu-Jitsu training. So we're talking about the Meiji era and the Taisho era, so late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, we're going to be looking at old books, obviously, and just talk in general about MMA because everyone knows what MMA is about, but it's very good to compare it with something that also try to have a very wholesome approach when it comes to the military, self-defense, and even competing. So today, a lot of people consider MMA to be the standard uh, or the gold standard to which to compare everything else. And today, I'm going to be comparing it with something that used to be wholesome, like old Japanese jiu-jitsu. So when it comes to Japanese jiu-jitsu, it's important to know that in the past, schools had separate curriculums. So each school had what is called the self-defense or kata training, which was live drilling against particular scenarios and self-defense. So weapons, strikes, etc. And striking was more catered towards the grappling. So it was a gateway to your grappling. So their training was mostly grappling, having the strikes to connect everything together. It's not like you know, you have to be an elite striker and an elite grappler like in MMA. So self-defense was very important. You hear about all these records that were written back in the day regarding which school is better for training the police, whether it is the Tokyo police or the uh, Kyoto police, etc. So a lot of the times these schools would train a lot of self-defense as well as just regular sparring. Um, and also dojo storming, meaning any school can come knocking at your door at any second, trying to challenge you and possibly take away your students and also somewhat dishonor your family name because jujitsu schools were built on family names. So sparring and also doing live drilling against all these weapons and strikes and scenarios was very crucial. Now, when it comes to MMA, we know that it serves a very particular purpose, which is winning in the octagon. So what you have is only one fighter that you have to beat. You have to be very skilled in grappling and striking. So when it comes to striking, yes, there is a demand to be an elite striker. A lot of these fights are ending up in KOs and very few or a lot of the strikers actually um, do not want to go to the ground and they want to have a striking oriented fight while others want to have a more grappling oriented fight so you really cannot know so being somewhat elite in both is very crucial obviously the gi is not there so grappling without the gi is your go-to stand up wrestling when it comes to takedown or even judo and on the ground judo's newaza and submission grappling here you can see paddy pimblet utilizes a lot of judo takedowns he's training with justin flores one of the best american judokas in my opinion so you have to be a wholesome grappler and striker when it comes to mma and that's your sole goal because you need to win in the octagon not wearing the jacket is also highly recommended obviously so now another part of the curriculum of the old jujitsu is Randori. You see it in the books. You have a Randori section, which here you see the techniques. It's much like Judo's takedowns. There was no striking. It's mostly stand-up grappling and ground grappling. You see the techniques that you know today. A lot of the records talk about, you know, X from this school used Osotogari and then the other guy used Harai Goshi. It seems like they're all just doing Judo. Now, we need to understand that they shared a lot of these techniques within each other, these schools. Were there secret techniques, a little trick here and there? Uh, of course, this is still the case today when it comes to gripping, when it comes to setting up techniques, etc. You want an advantage against your competitors. So when there was peace in inner Japan, starting from the Edo period in the 1600s, there was no war anymore. So it was mainly for self-defense, but competing became very popular amongst uh, schools. So when competing became very, very popular and safe at the same time or safer than uh, battlefields, 
ground grappling became more popular. You are against one man and you need as much as advantage as possible. So you see ground grappling, these very important positions that we all know were very much practiced at the same time, like side control, side headlock, rear naked choke, and pinning and the guard all were trained. So this idea that all of a sudden in the 20th century, we're all training ground grappling and this is a new revelation is just simply false. Uh, when competing became very popular, so did ground grappling because it was a new way to win on the ground. You don't want to be a half grappler. So you hear or read these records from uh, Maruyama Sanzo's book. There was minutes and minutes on end in these positions on the ground and then they stood up and fought for extra dozens of minutes. Obviously the rules were different back then, but for someone to spend dozens of minutes on the ground, it means they knew what they were doing. So a lot of the fights ended either in unconsciousness or the tap out or someone verbally saying they cannot go anymore. The Ippon was not there. So you needed to be a good submission grappler and also know your positions on the ground. So there was self-defense curriculum and Rendori curriculum, which catered to both to the stand up and the ground. It's very important to know these two things. Here you see Gunji Koizumi, a Jujutsuka drilling guard passes and also guard retention in the previous footage. So he, you can see the level of sophistication when it came to ground grappling, even from the late 1800s when people started writing records up until I, I would say World War II uh, with Tsunetane Oda and his books and his writing. So the fighting was absolutely brutal and it was until sheer exhaustion and tapping out was not an option for a lot of these grapplers as you see here in front of you. So KOs were very common. Now, another thing that I would really, it's important to point out is that from these old depictions, here you see they took off their garments and they were training in basically their underwear. So it wasn't just only with the gi or only with the jacket and the pants, but also without it. So to say, again, no gi came from wrestling or catch and the gi came from judo only. Again, this is just simply not the case. The evidence points otherwise. They needed to train in everything because, again, training for the streets and self-defense was crucial for them and not just, you know, to win in competition or train the police. So they had a far more wholesome approach than people would think. And finally, conditioning. Um, being explosive, being uh, flexible, being in shape is very important. So in MMA, they're not bodybuilders, obviously, but they do lift weights, they do conditioning exercises, they do rowing, they do cardio. And of course, they lift weights for stronger muscles and of course, muscular uh, endurance to last as, as long as possible in the octagon. Gassing out is a big phenomenon that everyone wants to avoid. Now, when it comes to the late Meiji and early Taisho era, there were a lot of popular exercises from the West starting to come in like uh, Radio Taisho. Here you see the dumbbell exercises very similar to Eugene Sandow's method of using dumbbells. Also a lot of body weight exercises, handstand walks, handstand push-ups, um, stuff that made them much stronger and much more mobile. So here you see, you know, working on your vertical is also very important. Uh, the access to weights room was not a thing at the time or very few had access to a weights room. So a lot of it was just working with each other, lifting each other up, squatting each other's weights, um, putting each other on their backs and doing push-ups, uh, doing standing on the necks, etc. So there's just a multitude of ways of training their bodies and conditioning themselves. So as you see here from this old school footage, uh, going to the weights room is a relatively new phenomenon. There was ways to condition yourself and make yourself stronger, which will ultimately translates to a better grappler when it comes to competition, obviously. So uh, if you have anything else to add, please let me know down below. 
consider supporting me on Patreon for exclusive content and keeping this content here on this channel going. This was Shadi, and thank you for listening.